Hello and welcome to our online service at CGMC Ipo. We have just moved into the Chinese New Year season this weekend. And for those of you who are celebrating, let me wish you all a blessed Chinese New Year. May the year ahead be filled with God's perfect abundance, grace and peace. Let us all now rise to our feet for the call to worship. We gather here at this time as family, the family of God. We are, we are here, here, members, members friends and, and visitors, visitors, guiding young people in God's way. We are here, children, youth and young adults, with hope and enthusiasm for our future. We are here, parents, aunts and uncles, grandparents and senior members of our congregation who are connected with the many generations of family. Today, we all gather as children of God to be open to God's message to us. And let us say it together. Let our eyes and ears be open to God's word that lives from generation to generation. Amen. And now, let us say the opening prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the family unit which was ordained by you from the beginning. Help us to be good parents who instruct those in our care wisely. Help us also to be childlike in our relationship with others and to respect and honor them as unto the Lord. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us worship our God together. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoices. He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice Trembles at his voice How great is our God Sing with me how is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. And each to each His land, and time will sing His hands, beginning and the end. Beginning and the end, the God we dream of. 
move on into our time of prayer. Heavenly Father, you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever and your faithfulness to all generations. We come on bended knee to acknowledge our utter dependence upon you, our Creator God, our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. As we face these uncertain times in our nation and in the world, we humbly seek you with all our hearts together in this church gazing longingly at you, O Lord, for your grace and mercy. We trust in your loving care for us, for our church and for our nation. Only you, O Lord, have the answers for the many unsolved mysteries that confront us today. Father, with every day of the news, it seems that only affliction and death increases. O Lord, we seek you in repentance, with broken and contrite hearts, embracing the truth, that our Lord Jesus has paid the price for our sins and right unrighteousness. We now humbly bring before you our prayers and petitions, O Lord. 
let us now pray for the various items. We will first pray for Malaysia. Let us pray for our government to practice good governance and accountability for the good of all our people. Let us pray for deliverance from the COVID-19 pandemic for people to maintain adherence to the SOPs that have been put into place to curb the spread of the virus. Let us give thanks for peace and goodwill as families celebrate Chinese New Year safely in accordance with the rules of the MCO. Let us go to God in prayer. Let us now pray for our churches. We give thanks to churches, pastors and leaders who recently attended the Prayer United Annual Conference. They have heard the Lord's call to repentance and continue to pray for the healing of our land. Let us pray for parents to help their ch children discover how God has equipped them to use their gifts in a positive way as adults. Let us pray. Let us now pray for Canning Garden Methodist Church. Let us pray for our three pastors to have a deep awareness of the love of God so that they can go through almost anything and persevere in the work that God has called them to. Let us also pray for the leaders in our three congregations to work with the pastors with unity of spirit, vision and purpose. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the year that has gone by and for your amazing faithfulness and love showered upon us. Thank you that you've carried us through the uncertainty of deep waters, through the flames of trials and through the pain of losses. We are constantly aware of how much we need you, O Lord, for your grace, for your strength, your power working through even the darkest of days. Surely all of this has brought us stronger in our faith and trust in you. Heavenly Father, we approach your throne room this new year with contrite hearts, yearning for your comfort and your continued grace. In the midst of this COVID-19 spreading across the globe, we ask in your mercy that you will stop this plague and restore health to Malaysia and the nations. We pray for comfort and strength for those who have lost loved ones to this disease and for those suffering from these effects. May your peace that surpasses all understanding fill their hearts. Loving Father, for the year ahead, please pour out your abundant compassion on this hurting world through all of us, your servants. May people see the love of Christ as we reach out to bless the many anxious hearts and troubled minds of those who now face great stress. Please protect them and their families from long-term financial problems and guide them day by day, opening the doors of help and employment. Finally, O Lord, we beg your pardon in many failings and trespasses and pray that in the year ahead, we will become more responsible in our pursuits, our faith and in our prayer life, always keeping our eyes on you, our blessed Redeemer. May we in this new year be ever more sensitive to the Holy Spirit, to live holy lives and always follow all things of you and you alone. Please protect us, your people, and watch over all of us in our coming and going. In Jesus' name we pray. And now, let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now the offertory prayer together. We give with joy into your kingdom today. May you bless our offering. Come, O Lord, and work through these gifts. Extend your love through us, we pray. Amen. Hi everyone, my name is Jane and I'm from Ipo. My testimonial for you all is, um, yeah, i grown up in a non-Christianity family whereby my family is uh, Taoism and there always been this mindset of doing good deeds and good things will return in some ways. That's what Taoism's mindsets. But over the years, my parents decided to change their mindset and I couldn't recall when they went into Christianity and I don't know what makes that move. Ever since then, I heard so much about God and how much Jesus sacrificed for us. In such a way, my parents are trying their best to save souls and I do listen to them and try to follow their advice and go to church but it didn't happen right away until recently. I decided to explore more about Christianity through families and through daily Bible verses. I joined Alpha since 2020 during the COVID hits and gets to know all of y'all, know about Christianity and discussing, thinking about finding answers to questions to strengthen my faith and prayers in life. Guess what? I've bought my very first life Bible <laughs> and with no doubt that this is my favorite book and I owned 
and been flipping it, reading it daily. So, do I encourage participants in Alpha? Definitely a yes. What could it be better than strengthening our faith, developing lasting relationship, friendship with God? First step is always the hardest move, but you will be surprised by having faith with God. Jesus said, with God, all things are possible from Matthew chapter 19, 26. Amen. Um, like the 2 Son series was very holistic. I'm, I'm just thinking like maybe in that situation, we give thanks, remembering like maybe past scenarios where we were in a tough spot and still God came through. Encouraging each other also very important. Uh, mm. This is a very good uh, two seven CV happened in my life. We really enjoy the cost. I can tell you the truth, uh, the <coughs> fellowship, the moment, uh, how we may spur one another. If I'm not spur one another, if people not spur about me, how am I going to grow up and move on? So yeah. I never give up. I have fun. I have joy. I have a uh, precious moment for seven of you. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, initially, uh, I I thought uh, I will never finish two seven. Uh, I struggle in the beginning of you know, the first few weeks, and then week after week, lah. Uh, no, actually, I get to enjoy doing it, uh, I I enjoy uh, all day we are together. So after I saw you, uh, my I uh, asked me, uh, what am I supposed to to to? Say, I better do something, la, write something. La. Okay, say at present times, if I am sick, how do I give thanks? Mm -hmm. I give thanks uh, for the, for the no knowledge, uh, uh, for the wisdom that uh, God is with me. Has a better plans for me, which is written in the Jeremiah 29 11. I didn't thank God for the circumstance uh, then. Later on, um, when I realized that. Um, God taught me a very valuable lesson. If I want it bad enough, God will still allow it. It's more than just material to go through. Not just a course. It is about coming together and being there with one another. It gave us somebody to walk through life together with us. It allowed us to open our hearts to each other and be vulnerable. It's amazing to see how pouring into other people leads to them pouring into other people and just seeing that multiplication aspect of it is just incredible. I, and I would say if you have the opportunity to be a part of it, do it. Don't wait, do it. Hello again and welcome to our service online. Uh, once again, let me wish you all who celebrate Chinese New Year a blessed Chinese New Year. Although we may not be able to get together, but it's wonderful that we're able to worship together as a body of Christ online. If it is your first time joining us online, uh, we'd like to encourage you to drop us a note on our website or on our Facebook page. We would really love to connect with you. Let us stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father's Son and Holy. Shalom, folks. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I'm Chia, better known as Cha Cha Chia. This weekend, I would like to share a story with you. Wednesday morning, 27 January 2021, was indeed a very memorable day in my life. Because of my daily aches and pains, I was struggling to get out of bed that morning. It was going to be a long, hard day. When my wife May opened the bedroom door, she saw a mole, a rat-like creature with a long nose, running into the living room. 
This creature had got into the house two days earlier, but we could not find it anywhere. She got so frightened, she shouted to me. This got me out of bed in a second. We shut out all exits in the living room except the main entrance. Together, May armed with a walking stick and I with a broom and a can of H2O, we went looking for the creature. It was running all over the place and hiding from behind the TV and consoles, under the sofa and all over. Whenever it ran out from under a console or sofa, I would run after it, and May, instead of helping to corner it, she was running away from it. In the end, we bumped into each other more often than anything else. I was quite worried she would fall on me and flatten me instead of the mole. It was so comical and exciting, more like a cartoon you see on TV. We laughed a lot. It took us more than an hour to finally sweep it out of the main entrance, which we left open because we didn't want to kill it. In that one hour of excitement, I've forgotten all about my aches and pains. It was about 9.15 a.m. I was able to get into gear and start the day again. You see, I'm awakened daily by aches and pain all over my body, in addition to the sleep apnea. Some mornings, the pain is so bad, I honestly wished I was dead. I carry this unexplained pain throughout the day. Some days, it is more intense. Most days, it is tolerable because I've learned to live with it but it still affects my temperament of the day. Some days I'm more patient and some days less tolerant. Please forgive me when I'm less tolerant. You don't know what I'm going through. What I want to say here is God's blessings come in many different ways. I was expecting the day to be hard and long suffering, but it sent a mole to change everything. The one hour of excitement and laughter got rid of most of my pains and I was able to get through the day fruitfully. Looking back, I truly thank God for sending the mole into our home. It changed my day altogether for the better. Praise the Lord. All glory to God the Father. A few years ago, I became the sole caregiver to both my aged parents. My father, a non-believer, was stricken with final stage lung cancer, coupled with spinal disease and depression. Never would I thought that I would get very sick when I was caring for my parents. I was suffering from dengue fever back in October 2013. The attack came suddenly, which landed me in hospital for four nights. My doctor wouldn't discharge me, as my platelet count wasn't improving. The thought of death became real at that point. All sorts of fear raised through my mind. The fear of having nobody to care for my parents really hit me the hardest. As I was still in hospital, nothing much I could do except to trust God, as I knew my life was in His hands. Never in my life have I placed so much trust in him. This episode was really a test of my faith. I told God that I was willing to accept whatever outcome he had for me. I truly praised him as he healed me and I was given the green light to return home on the fifth day. From that day onwards, I am grateful for all that he has been to me. He is the only true Father that I can rely on for the rest of my days here on earth and till eternity too.
Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 25, to chapter 6, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and his joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. This is a great mystery. But it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. Chapter 6, verse 1 Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honour your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honour your father and mother, things will go well for you. And you will have a long life on earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A happy Chinese New Year to all of you. The text for today is taken from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 to chapter 6, verse 4. And what a better chance to talk about family than on Chinese New Year weekend. It is a time that families get together. But unfortunately, this year, most of us cannot meet together in person. But praise the Lord, through Zoom, FaceTime or video calls, we can still keep in touch. I'm so grateful for modern technology. As I prepared for today's message, I felt that the Lord wanted us to reflect on our respective roles in our families as husbands, wives, parents, and children. We will also see what the Bible says about the relationship between the church as the bride of Christ and our Lord Jesus as the groom. So let us look at this portion of scripture from Ephesians and listen to what God is speaking to us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for our families, our parents, our brothers, our sisters, our spouse, our children, and grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. We are so grateful for each and every one of them. And as we look to your scriptures, we pray that you will bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts. And may they be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, Amen. Before we begin, I would like us to take a brief look at the context of our message today. The letter to the Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul. Paul, who was earlier known as Saul, was a Jewish Pharisee who persecuted Christians in his 20s. But on the road to Damascus in around 35 AD, he was about 30 at that time. He had a personal encounter with Jesus and he became a believer. 
This was recorded in detail in Acts chapter 9. And Pastor Andrew spoke about this three weeks ago. Paul's conversion was very dramatic and he became a powerful servant of God, doing deliverance, healing, preaching and missionary work. He went on three missionary journeys. The first missionary journey was around 46 to 48 AD and he travelled mainly in the region of Galatia and he wrote the letter to the Galatians around 49 AD. His second missionary journey was in 49 to 52 AD and he travelled further up to Greece and into Corinth where he spent a year there. Then he stopped by the city of Ephesus in Asia Minor on the way back to Jerusalem. He preached the gospel and established a church there in Ephesus, Aquila and Priscilla. Fellow believers Paul had brought from Corinth stayed on in Ephesus to build up the community of believers there. Apollos, who later went on to Corinth to minister to the believers there, came from Ephesus. What about Ephesus? Ephesus was a large city. Its population was about 200,000, making it the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire at that time, after Rome, Alexandria and Syrian Antioch. It lies in the west of modern-day Turkey and during modern New Testament times was described as being in Asia. When the Bible says Asia, it doesn't mean the Asia that we know now, but it referred to Asia Minor. The people there were Gentiles and they worshipped the Greek god Artemis. And the temple there was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It had a huge amphitheatre that could seat 50,000 people, which is still present as a tourist attraction today. After he finished his visit to Jerusalem, Paul returned to Ephesus around 53 AD during his third missionary journey, and he ministered there for two to three years until 55 AD, which is longer than any other place that he ministered in. So Paul had a special relationship with the church in Ephesus and probably knew the people there intimately. And hence, he touched on the roles of the families whom he was probably well acquainted with. This letter was written much later from Rome while Paul was under house arrest in around 60 to 62 AD. Unlike some of the other letters that he wrote, the letter to the Ephesians did not address any particular problem that the church was facing. Instead, this letter was to instruct the church on the significance of its union with Christ and its practical implications. In the text read to us today, Paul draws the analogy of a marriage to the relationship between Christ and the church. Christ is the groom and the church is the bride. Christ as the groom loves the church so much that he sacrificed himself on the cross to purchase our redemption. Through Christ's selfless death on the cross, we who are believers receive forgiveness of our sins. Not only that, we exchange our sinfulness for Christ's righteousness. Verse 26 says that Christ has presented the church to himself without stain or wrinkle or blemish, but holy and blameless. But what do we see today? Is the church really perfect and without blemish? We hear of incidents happening amongst church members and even church leaders. And we wonder how the Bible can say that the church is without blemish. This is because we exchange 
our sinfulness with the righteousness of Christ by faith. It is not that we ourselves are leading blameless lives. We are all still sinners, but by the grace of God, we are considered righteous. And this is not something which happens only sometime in the future, on Judgment Day. But even now, in the present, we are already justified by faith. And we are expected to live a new life in Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, which has been bestowed on all believers as a deposit guaranteeing our future inheritance. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So brothers and sisters, we should not be living as in our pre-believer state, still a slave to sin and expecting to be set free only on judgment day. Romans 6, 11 says, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Is the Bible referring to our present or sometime in the future? Obviously, the Bible is referring to our present state on earth, where we are still inhabiting our mortal bodies. So while we may not experience the fullness of sinlessness before we are taken to meet the Lord, yet we are expected while on earth as children of God to live by the Spirit. Romans 8 verse 5 says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Even in the passage read today, the Bible precludes it in Ephesians 5 verse 18 by saying, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So everything we are going to examine today hinges on that fact that we behave differently when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul then turns our attention to the husband-wife relationship. He already started this whole discussion with the underlying principle that we must all submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is mentioned in chapter 5, verse 21. He now uses Christ's example as what is expected of husbands. Husbands are to imitate Christ and be willing to sacrifice for their wives. What a turnaround from what I suppose would be the norm in the first century. Even in the 21st century, we can see a tide of change from previous generations. In our church, we have a WhatsApp group for young fathers. And I am pleased to see that all of them help their wives out with looking after their young children. Changing diapers and feeding the kids is no longer seen as the mother's duty alone. So if we were to imagine what it was, back, it was like back in the first century, I think Paul's message that husbands should be ready to sacrifice for their wives would not have been easy to swallow. So coming back, to our modern day application. What does this passage say to us? We husbands are to love our wives like our own bodies. The Bible tells us that when we are married, the two become one. And so when your wife is hurting, whether physically or emotionally, we should also feel the pain. When you shout or you raise your voice, when you quarrel 
or say hurting words, you will be hurting yourself in the process. The guiding principle is to be like Christ, to treat our wives like how Christ treats the church. It is a tall order indeed, but that is what the Lord expects of us. The husband must never exercise his authority in a domineering manner. Husbands are expected to be willing to sacrifice to make their wife's well-being of primary importance, to be her protector and to care for her needs as he cares for his own body. But verse 28 brings up an interesting point. We are asked to love our wives as our own bodies. But wait a minute. What if there are some of us who don't love our bodies? Hmm? Are there people who don't love their own bodies? Well, chances are there are some of us who wish we were taller, slimmer, have bigger eyes, six-pack abs, more hair, better complexion, no wrinkles. The list goes on and on, which is why aesthetic medicine is such a flourishing business. And this is one aspect that the media has affected our outlook. We think we need to look perfect in order to love ourselves. But the Bible is not referring to those aspects of our body. Verse 29 clarifies this for us. The Bible talks about feeding and caring for our bodies. These are basic fundamental instincts that all of us have. None of us, except those with psychiatric problems, would purposely inflict pain upon ourselves. And it is natural that we would eat whenever we are hungry, especially if, uh, except when we were fasting for a reason. So the Bible is using this analogy that we know how to take care of our bodies, that we should also ensure that our wife's needs are well taken care of, both physically and emotionally, and that we should never inflict pain or harm to our spouse. It is possible to love and care for our bodies even though we think it is not perfect. It is possible to love and care for our spouses even when they are not perfect. It is wonderful news that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her even though the church is not yet perfect. What about the wife? The Bible says that the wife is to respect the husband. This is not what I say. This is directly from Scripture in chapter 5, verse 33. Is this an excuse that all men can use to override their wife? Can I snapshot this verse on my phone and show it to my wife whenever we have a disagreement? No, we need to read the whole paragraph to understand the Bible's perspective. The relationship between the husband and wife is a two-way mutual submission. According to commentators, the Greek grammar suggests that this mutual submission is enabled by the filling of the Holy Spirit described in Ephesians 5 verse 18. So if there is mutual submission by the Spirit, and if the husband has a sacrificial love for his wife, then of course his wife would respect him. But if the husband is not filled by the Holy Spirit, if he does not have a sacrificial love for his wife, but puts his own needs first, then it is no wonder that the wife does not respect him. This submission applies only to her husband and not to every man. As we move on to chapter 6, 
the Bible turns our attention to the relationship between parents and children. Children are expected to obey and honour their parents in the Lord. What does this expression mean? It means that children subject themselves to parental authority as they would to God. However, it would seem that if parents misuse their position and request the children to do something which is contrary to God's law, then the children should obey God rather than the parents. This situation should not arise if the whole household is filled with the Holy Spirit as in a fully Christian family. Of course, there are circumstances which may not be clear-cut. In the New Testament times, many households were converted together. Hence the expression in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. But in present times, we may have individuals who have become believers, but still live under the roof of an unbelieving parent. The principle still holds that the child should honour the parent and the believer child should try to win over the unbelieving parent by being a shining witness for Christ in the home. However, certain issues such as eating food offered to idols, spending time reading God's word and attending worship services are fundamental to our faith. The child will need to explain to the unbeliever parent gently and prayerfully, patiently waiting for the time when the parent is able to understand and allow the believer child to practice his or her faith. What about adult children with elderly parents? In my medical practice, I see elderly patients every day. Often they are accompanied by their adult children. There's a dynamic shift in our relationships with our parents throughout our lives. When I was young, my parents fed me and carried me. And I mean literally. I still remember falling asleep in the car and my dad would carry me up to the bedroom. When they were old and sick, it was my turn to carry and feed them, as some of you saw in the videos last year when my father was terminally ill. Some families adapt to the change well, but some do not. I sometimes see frustrations as elderly parents who have become demented still insist on doing things their own way and their adult children struggle daily to handle the flood of emotions that come from seeing their parents grow weaker each day. I think this is where chapter 6 verse 2 comes in to give us guidance. We should honour our parents. This sometimes involves this sometimes involves making tough decisions, especially when our parents are no longer able to make them. Just as when we were young, our parents would make decisions for our own good, like forcing us to eat vegetables or preventing us from playing out in the rain. But when our parents are old, it is our turn to make the decisions for their well-being but always with love and respect. This may involve what kind of medical care they should receive and whether they would need nursing care and how they can keep up their nutrition when they no longer have a good appetite and refuse everything you buy for them. I know some of you are going through this now and I pray that God will give you wisdom on how to cope. Fathers are warned in verse 3 not to exasperate their children. What is exasperate? Exasperate in the Merriam-Webster's dictionary 
is to disturb the peace of mind of someone, especially by repeated disagreeable acts. Colossians chapter 3 verse 21 says it in another way, Do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. What are some of the ways we may exasperate our children? It may be in the form of inconsistent instructions, one day saying something and the next day giving different instructions. Our discipline of children must be consistent and the boundaries we set on their behaviours need to be clear-cut. Furthermore, we must match what we say with what we do. We cannot tell our children not to cheat, but we ourselves do not scratch the parking tickets when we park. We cannot expect our children to love the Word of God when we ourselves don't have a consistent quiet time. A Christian parent's primary purpose should be to bring up the children in the training and instruction of the Lord. If our child stays with us until the age of 18, we only have 6,570 days to influence their beliefs and values before they leave for further studies and work. Isn't that a thought? Isn't that thought sobering? This can be done by being an example to the children in worship, prayer and studying of the word. It has been said that children see what you do as much as or even more than what you say to them. So what would a parent need to do other than being an example to their child? Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 to 9 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be in your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. What would a modern day equivalent of this be like? Talk to your children about God when you go for a walk, when you are travelling in the car, before they sleep, while you are having a meal. Learn to worship and pray as a family. I still remember while growing up, that there would be framed wordings around my house like Christ is the head of this house to remind me of the Lord's Lordship in our family. And when my children were still young, we used to have a practice of reciting one, two, seven memory verse every night before they sleep. You'll be surprised how well children take to memory verses. While we expect every member of CGMC to send their children to Sunday school, we cannot expect that one to two hours a week will be enough. The parents are still responsible to water the seeds that have been sown. Take every opportunity to engage your children about matters of faith. When they are younger, it will be more of a one-way teaching and showing through example. But as the children grow older, it should be a two-way discourse. Teenagers will have many doubts and questions, and parents should not brush aside these questions, but allow honest sharing and discussion on where our children are in their journey of faith. In the process of exploring life questions, we may be surprised that our faith can be deepened by searching for answers to our teenagers' questions. Parents sometimes find it difficult to adapt as our children grow. Initially, we are so happy they are able to ask questions and we are more than happy to answer them. 
But the questions become more complex and difficult to answer as the children grow up. And sometimes we parents find the words, I don't know, very difficult to utter. We as parents sometimes feel like we have failed if we don't provide a satisfactory answer to all our children's questions. But there can be a better way. Honestly tell your child if you don't know the answer to a question they ask and offer to find the answer together. The journey of discovery will help us to build a stronger faith base as well as a bond between the parent and child. We will also help our child to get the habit of looking for answers which will help them in life, not only in faith matters, but also in their journey to maturity. If we dismiss questions and doubts brought by our teenage children, they will either seek for answers from their peers or from the internet, or else they may even grow up thinking that the Christian faith does not have answers and that our faith needs to be blindly accepted without question. This will lead to a shallow faith which can be shaken when trials and difficult times come. It is crucial that we allow the channels of communication on faith matters to be open as our teenagers try to discover and grow a personal faith. In my cell group, less than a third of us come from Christian homes. The majority come from non-Christian backgrounds and were converted later on in life. A survey in the US shows that many church youths do not practice the faith after leaving home for further studies or work. If we do not pass our faith to the next generation, our churches will be faced with an aging population which is already happening in the Western world and beginning to be seen in some of our local churches as well. So, do we know what happened to the church in Ephesus after 62 AD? We know from 2 Timothy written and around 66 AD that Timothy was put in charge of the church there. Aquila and Priscilla were still ministering there. Tradition says that the Apostle John also went to Ephesus to minister there before he was exiled to the island of Patmos. The church in Ephesus was the first of the seven churches given a warning in Revelation, written in 95 AD. They had initially persevered and endured hardships for Christ, but by the end of the first century, they were guilty of losing their first love. If they did not heed the warning, God would remove their lampstand from its place. How sad! Did they heed the warning? The Third Ecumenical Council of Rome was held in Ephesus in 431 AD. So we know that there was still a church there in the 5th century. But now, Turkey has less than a 2% Christian population. I hope and pray that CGMC will be able to raise up a new generation of committed believers, that we will not lose our first love for Christ, that we will not neglect passing on the torch to our young adults and youths, and that decades and maybe even centuries from now, this church will still be standing as a light for Christ in Ipoh, vibrant and filled with the Spirit, full of families living for Christ and witnessing for Christ. So in conclusion, we are all members of the church, the bride of Christ, Jesus loved the church so much, in spite of our sinfulness, that he gave himself sacrificially for us on the cross. Through his death, we receive forgiveness of our, by faith, 
not sometime in the future, but even now in the present. But our duty as a follower of Christ is to be filled with the Spirit, to live according to the Spirit. This should be evident in our relationships with our families. We should imitate Christ in how we treat our family members, spouse, parents, children. And finally, we must ensure that we leave a legacy for the next generation to follow, to pass on our faith, our vision, and our love for the Lord. Let us pray. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus loved the church so much that he came to die on the cross for the church, even though we are still sinners. And Lord, we want to thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, that through your Spirit, we can live a life which is pleasing to you. We can live a life which is Spirit-enabled. We pray, Father, that we will continue to be witnesses for you wherever we are. And we want to pray and thank you for our families, that our fathers, our mothers, our spouse, our brothers, sisters, our children, we thank you for each and every one of them. And we pray that we will play our role in our family, that we will be able to pass on our faith and to strengthen our faith within our families. And Father, we want to pray that our church, CGMC, will continue to be a spirit-filled church, that we will continue to minister to the people of Ipoh, and that we will be a shining light and salt to the nation. We commit ourselves to you once again in Jesus' name. Amen.
And now let's all rise to receive the benediction. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and keep you. Amen. Amen.